we have a moral obligation, my view is if you support the troops, then you need to support the people who supported the troops. So these are all under threat from the Taliban for bodily injury and, and possibly being killed. So these these people and and the other heartbreaking thing is a lot of these people they're you know they're they're hiding out wherever they can uh, around within Kabul or outside Kabul, but they're many are running out of food and water too. We're hearing uh, so it's really just becoming a desperate situation for them. In this moment, there is a, a vacuum that can be exploited to get individuals to safety. The more the Taliban button down the hatches and figure out who's who, uh, the more the those individuals who are bouncing around become at risk because the Taliban can say, you know, we're going to shut down these hotels or you're only going to stay in your own homes. We're going to search you know, door to door, which they've done in a lot of neighborhoods. That's really where the risk is going to come into these individuals is when the Taliban get organized enough to figure out you know, who's missing and then track down those individuals. We're talking about civilians and we're talking about people who work in the military. And they're at heightened risk because of that work now. And they will flee by land. Some will be able to navigate Taliban checkpoints to obtain access to airports, which may have a limited number of commercial or chartered flights in the future. But a, a lot of these people are gonna flee over land and present themselves in various places bordering Afghanistan. The journey to the north and through Iran to Turkey and beyond is extraordinarily perilous and gets worse in the winter. I mean, the Alborz Mountain between Iran and Turkey, you know, are snow-capped. And you, you'll have, we've, had, we've interviewed refugees in Greece who have walked across snow-capped mountains. They've swam across rivers. They have swam across the Aegean to Greek islands. I mean, tremendous risks. By one count, a person who traveled from Mazar Sharif through the Hindu Kush, through the large sailing tunnel, down back into the plains, Mazar Sharif, something like 17 Taliban checkpoints. You know, and each of those 17 times, money changing hands, each of those 17 times, you're running the risk of somebody flagging you for who you are, what you did. But now we've seen a collapse at the top when our commander in chief starts, you know, making these decisions that do not benefit the military and they do not benefit the American people. And how do we negotiate to get the people out of Afghanistan? But at this point, there is no doubt about it. There will probably be some type of money exchange in order to bring these people home safely. And it did not have to be that way. But for many of these people, they have no choice. You know, it's stay and be killed by the Taliban or flee and try to make a new life somewhere else. So they, it's not like a choice for a lot of these people. We get these folks out through diplomatic coercion of neighboring countries. We get them out through ensuring that the Taliban are held to account. Uh, the, the sad reality is right now, we do not have a lot of leverage. Uh, and relative to the numbers we need to get out, you know, these are not folks that we're gonna be able to rescue on, you know, covert helicopter flights. I mean, the, the, this is in tens of thousands of individuals that we still need to evacuate, that we should have been evacuating since April when a bipartisan group of my colleagues in the House uh, urged the administration to clear the backlog if we were sticking to this withdrawal date, to clear the backlog and get out as many individuals as we could before our military forces were out. You can't give the Taliban the names of the people you want admitted because then you've given them the names of people who are at risk. So it's a very tricky dance about how to negotiate this with the Taliban. And to the best of our knowledge, the best way to have it be re reconciled is to bring in the United Nations. We ought to be seeking a humanitarian corridor so that if people want to leave, they should be allowed to leave unmolested. That's currently not in the, on, in the cards right now. Something has to be done. If you just if you just keep whistling past this and pretending that the Taliban's basically going to be a hermit kingdom without any flights out, that's not going to be in the best interests of the Afghans we want to help and the Afghans are allies we want to help. It's easy to say, oh, we should just cut off the Taliban and cut off this country from the world, but we're fast approaching a point where we need to recognize that despite being a loathsome rights abusing regime, we're going to have to do business with these folks if we want to help the people we care about and help the Afghans who have gotten stuck behind. You have to come together even with the most loathsome 
people to come to agreements about how to save innocent people or people at risk. I think we're gonna have this problem for months and potentially a couple years. We need some attention paid on Afghanistan so that international pressure remains on the Taliban to allow for this to happen. Because if it's forgotten and people move on, they move on to the World Series, they move on to the next hurricane, this is easy to stop paying attention to. So we need to have a little bit of attention on this and some international pressure continue to be brought to bear or, um, or the, the, we will break faith with these people.